My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I am the Director of Business Development for draft to digital and we have, now he's above me on the screen. My name is Mark Leslie the, Lefebvre, the, the one, the only, the, the voice, of, the man who, who calls uh, is Pants Optional, Kevin Tomlinson. Hello there. Uh, I'm Kevin Thompson. I am the Director of Marketing and uh, Public Relations for draft to digital Awesome. And of course, on the screen that I'm looking at, when I look down below me, I see my esteemed and prestigious boss, the one and only, the marvelous, <laughs> the man, Dan the man, Dan Wood. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Wood, Vice President of Operations here at draft digital It's good to be here. Cool. And uh, you cannot see her, but we desperately need her and rely on her every month to control the strings in the background. Think of her like the, the woman behind the curtain <clears throat> from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, Alyssa master. is helping out in the background, and she's going to be taking some of these questions, and she's going to be punting them over to us. And I think we're going to probably start with uh, the very first question. Uh, which I believe comes from, actually, I have to acknowledge Richard Stevens posted a comment with a little beer there. So cheers, Richard. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I, it was a good IPA. I saw it. Russell Phillips uh, asked the question, do you have any plans to introduce a way to split royalties between multiple authors? Would be useful for people doing collaborations or multi-author box sets? Yes, Russell, it would be amazingly uh, hel helpful. And it is actually something that we have developed and are in the process of still rolling out via our D2D shared universes platform. The whole structure of that platform was collaborations between authors, which does involve split royalties. Now, because of some of the challenges that we've had with some of the changes in the industry and some of the additional uh, developments that you know maybe weren't expected for 2019, that got pushed back a little bit. So that's something that'll probably be coming out um, in you'll see that coming in 2020 we do believe that the future of, of publishing is going to involve more collaborations for authors and we want to help authors help each other so that is something that is coming so thanks for asking for that russell and if you pay attention obviously to our blog and you're receiving the emails from us i'm sure that there'll be a crafty email coming from kevin about that when we're ready to uh ready to roll that into a full I, I cannot wait for for <laughs> us to add that feature uh mostly because we get so many questions about it but yeah. also because i i'm looking forward to using it myself so it's definitely something in the works it's gonna be pretty exciting um we have a uh i'm gonna i'm gonna hazard a guess on the last name i apologize if i get it wrong a question from Oh, wait. No, I was looking at the wrong question. That's Dan's problem. Okay. Uh, I have a question for <laughs> Veronica Lake. Uh, is self-publication the best route uh, or route, depending on your neck of the woods, uh, or through a publishing agency? And what is the best way to advertise my work? There's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, so the answer in general is going to be, uh, is public, is self -publication, is self publication the best route for you? Uh, yes and no. It really depends on your overall strategy. If you're, uh, depending on what your goals are, for a lot of folks, self publication is the best route, uh, mostly because we can control so much of the process. But if you need someone to kind of, you know, guide you and handhold you through, through some of this stuff, uh, there's nothing at all wrong with going for, a, you know, uh, getting a contract with an agent and a publisher. Uh, just know that, you know, you have less control of the process. Um, I'm not going to, you know, there, there, you, things can be a little, uh, uh, more, a little tricky when it comes to, uh, the amount of money you can make. Uh, I won't go too deep into that, but there's a, there's a lot to consider. So really just, you need to just figure out what your overall goal is. Uh, a lot of people get into this work because they want to see their books on shelves at Barnes and Noble. They want to see movies made of them, that kind of thing. Uh, that sort of thing is possible with, with self-publishing, but, uh, you know, it, so far it's still, it's a little easier to get that way if you get us a, a uh, traditional contract, but the, the trade-off is the amount of money and the amount of control. So, uh, as far as the last part of that question, uh, what's the best way to advertise your work? Uh, that's also variable. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of strategies out there. I would recommend uh, getting on Google, getting on YouTube, and and using that exact question uh, to start looking at the ways that are going to work best for you. Uh, but a lot of people rely on things like Facebook advertising, BookBub ads, uh, Amazon marketing services. You can advertise that way. Google ads are another option. But uh, so far, it's really sort of hit or miss all those are a little bit hit and hit or miss. You you really just kind of have to experiment, find the one that works for you, and then invest both time and money in uh, 
in getting really good at it. So those are difficult questions to answer actually. <laughs> they, they can get very specific to like yeah. your particular uh, right. circumstances as an author and your goals. Mm -hmm. um, we had two questions come in that were similar. So uh, from Karen uh, Carnahan, uh, will you all add Walmart to the list and Nicholas A. Pacioni? I hope that's right. Uh, okay, I'll buy it. How did you end up working with Walmart? Uh, so in answer to that, we already are, are sending books to Walmart. Uh, that is through Kobo. So if you distribute your books through Kobo on draft to digital or through Kobo Writing Life, uh, your books are already available at Walmart. Uh, Kobo is running the back end of their ebook distribution for them. And so, um, like if you download the Walmart app for eBooks, that's just the Kobo app kind of rebranded. Uh, if you buy a book at Kobo, it shows up in the Walmart app and vice versa. If you buy one of the Kobo devices, then you can buy from either Walmart or Kobo. Kobo has done a lot of partnerships like this with international retailers. So this is something that for them has been, um, has really worked well, uh, working with other brick and mortar retailers uh, in the UK, such as uh, I believe Waterstones and the, uh, so W.H. Smith, Mark, I don't know if you remember. Um, so uh, right we've now. been talking to Walmart for, for a while now, I think since like 2016. Uh, they weren't interested necessarily in making their own app. And so that partnership with Kobo ended up being a really great way for them to get eBooks onto their retail platform online. Um, the other part of Nicholas's question, he asked if we've looked into uh, LibreOffice.org uh, for making EPUB 3s. Um, our platform does let you upload any uh, EPUB. So if you've already got an EPUB, you can use whatever platform, whatever software you prefer to make the EPUBs. Um, we do recommend EPUB 2 because not all of the retailers throughout the world uh, support EPUB 3 yet. Um, so outside of a handful of cases, you don't really need EPUB 3 yet. The, the technology that it adds is not going to make a big difference. Uh, so we recommend sticking with EPUB 2 for the time being. Uh, sorry, we, we've we got some some interesting things yeah. going on behind the scenes <laughs> that's distracting all of yeah, us. Yeah, my apologies. Let me explain this. Um, uh, we had uh, a notice come up that says that it's going to shut this down in about four minutes and 45 seconds. That shouldn't happen because I think we've handled it in the back end. But if we happen to go away for 30 seconds, we will be right back. So don't panic. Bear, uh, bear with us, stick around. <laughs> everything's, still, everything's still good. We're just dealing with this on the fly while we're trying to uh, uh, answer your questions. Um, so Kevin, did you have another question that you wanted to address? Yeah, I got a couple here. Uh, the first one I want to address is Tammy Lebrecht asking who won the most money in slots in Vegas last week at 20 Books Vegas. Uh, and I'm going to assume that means out of the three of us. So... What did you guys win? What'd you come home with? Nobody came back in a in their private jet, so <laughs> I, I don't gamble at all. Like it just never has either. really uh, appealed to me. Like just not one of those things. So about I don't know twenty years ago, I went with some college friends to Vegas. I put some money into one of the slots. I won thirty dollars and I stopped right then. So I'm up thirty dollars <laughs> on one. No, I guess I'm, 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 I'm up like twenty nine dollars on Vegas, and I'm never yeah. gonna gamble there. Again. I, Last year, I put money in a slot machine while waiting near the, the men's room for everybody to come out. I won 89 cents for my dollar. I still count it as a win. Awesome. I put <laughs> not a dime in any one of those machines. I walked past every single one of them thousands of times, it felt like, as I was moving from place to place. So I won because I didn't play. It's, it's, we are <laughs> Great so question, well. Tammy. We're so lame. Okay. Uh, I do have another uh, legitimate question in three minutes, apparently, to answer it. Uh, what is the number one reason I should use draft? This is from Paul Christo, by the way. What is the number one reason I should use draft to digital instead of distributing myself? Um, I'm going to say, and you guys can weigh in on this, it's largely about uh, having everything consolidated in one place. It's about... Um, you know, saving time, basically. Uh, we also offer, there's a whole bunch of features that we offer. You can use most of those for free with or without distribution through us. Uh, but but uh, maybe the number one thing is our support. So if there's a problem, if you need to delist, if you need, you know, uh, if you're having a problem with a distributor, you're not getting paid, something like that, we take care of all that for you uh, instead of you having to chase it all down yourself. So I'd say that's probably number one. Number two is just the, 
the convenience factor. You guys want to weigh in? Well, I agree. Uh, we do offer a lot of distribution channels you can't go directly to. That's true too. Um, and so there are a handful of the bigger platforms that let you go directly. Uh, for most of our international retailers and a large portion of our library retailers, uh, we can't go directly to. And so that's one reason. Yeah. We've made our whole system set up to where everything is opt-in. So you can go directly everywhere you want to um, and then use us for everything else. Um, in many cases, uh, royalties are a little bit better. Like under two ninety nine or over nine ninety nine, our uh, royalties stay the same. With some of the direct platforms, if you go under or over those uh, marks, then your royalty gets cut in half. I was yeah, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that because I always forget about that one, which is a, a really important one. So it says less than a minute and I'm really concerned. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all worried about being able to answer a question properly in case it, it, so, it drops down. Are you seeing that remaining time on, on the top of the screen too? I am, yeah, yeah less, I am less than well. a minute. So um, guys, if we do drop, don't don't panic. Uh, yeah, stick we, around. We'll, yeah, be we'll, back. we'll be back if we drop out. <laughs> uh, can all I right. answer a question from uh, Ashlyn Chase? Do it. Ashlyn said, I'm bummed that Amazon won't allow pre-orders from books coming from D2D. Is that anything that can be changed? Ashlyn, I'm bummed too, because I have a book up for pre-order, but I couldn't put it up. Um, <laughs> I couldn't put it up through D2D. Um, so I, that is something that I think one of the challenges is our retailers have different um, perspectives. Our retailers have different ways that they deal with things. And Amazon is very particular about that. Dan, is that something that, um, is there a particular reason? Was there a business reason for that? Or was it just a structural thing with Amazon? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> at, at first they didn't, they didn't have a way to do it through um, the way we interact with Amazon. Okay. Um, that may be changing. Um, so it, we'll it could you all, uh, Yeah. Uh, yes. It's not something, um, it's definitely not something they said they'll, they'll never provide. Um, okay. So we are working with them on something. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Are we back? How, how'd we do? Yeah. Are you okay. Yeah. Now Dan's on top of me and Kevin's below me. This was just, uh, just shook it up a little bit. Are yeah. we back live in the feed? Alyssa or Kevin, can you see that? Uh, I'm out of that live feed. So okay. Alyssa has. Yes. Live. We are live. Alyssa. live. Okay. Hi Good. everybody. Uh, we're back. Welcome back. Yeah. Wow. Sorry about that technical challenge. But <laughs> but now we're now we're going to be focused because we're not going to be worried that it's going to suddenly shut down. Yes. Yeah. I think that was distracting us uh, uh, quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. let's get to some more questions. Who's got one, Mark? I I've been. Uh, I've got I've got one. So uh, Dorothy Zamak asks: Is there a time estimate on when books submitted in September might be available through Hoopla? So we are the absolute first platform to uh, help indies get into Hoopla at all. Um, they have a different sort of business model where they're providing any books that are approved into Hoopla go into, they're available to all the libraries to subscribe to Hoopla. So they do a little bit more uh, curation. They're uh, on their end, they're doing some of the checks that we do to make sure the content is appropriate. Um, so in general, Hoopla said they're going to take about two to three weeks to approve a book and we'll send it to them. Um, since when we opened up Hoopla, we sent about 60,000 books to them. Uh, it's taken them a little bit longer than that. And so um, for books submitted in September, I would guess maybe by the end of the year, uh, it's just they have quite a, a backlog to work through and they've been working through them steadily, but it is taking a little bit longer uh, than we would like. If you remember overdrive was kind of like this when indies first started running overdrive yeah. this takes a little bit longer as a a new partner lets indies into their realm to both trust the content and to get the processes in place uh, because indies are publishing so fast and so that's not something they're used to from working with uh, the traditional publishers sometimes this isn't just impacting libraries by the way we've some of our other uh, ventures will say uh, have been really surprised at the impact of uh, indie publishing and how quickly things change, uh, how quickly authors are publishing, not just the work they already have, but publishing new work 
and how quickly and how frequently they're making changes to that work. It's really thrown off the folks who were used to dealing with the traditional publishing world. <laughs> well, and that's funny because libraries are so used to doing it a completely different way, right? Amazon is an online bookstore. Kobo and Apple yeah. uh, Nook are online bookstores. They're used to rapid change. Libraries is a completely different process that's used to a lot longer lead times. So yeah, we are really taxing those systems. I've got a question from Ron, if I can, if I can throw it. Go for it. Uh, Ron Sauter asks, does D2D support differential pricing for libraries? Are you seeing any best practices that protect value for authors who are being read in libraries? Yeah, the, this is what I love about it, Ron, is we have a retail price, which is meant to go to our retail partners. And then we have a separate library price that goes to our various library partners that we're just talking about one of them. And what I love about that is if you're doing a price promo, let's say you've booked a book bub or something through written, written word media or something, and you wanted to drop the retail price to 99 cents for, I don't know, you know, Cyber Monday's coming up. You can still drop the retail price without ever having to change the library price. Cause again, you know, libraries and change don't move hand in hand as quickly. Like when we send an update to Amazon or Apple or Kobo, they're, they're relatively, uh, you know, quick to, uh, to get those. You can also schedule your price changes. Um, in terms of best practices uh, for library, um, because traditional publishers charge libraries so much money, uh, a, a standard book from a, a major library or a major uh, publisher, maybe anywhere in the realm from, it, it retails for let's say seven to $15, but the library price is often 30 to $100. It's depending on, on, on the publisher and what they're doing. Uh, on top of that, Macmillan Publishing recently announced that they would not be allowing libraries to buy more than one copy of their books from November 2000, November 1st, 2019 on. So a couple things to keep in mind is that let's say your retail price is $4.99 US for your book. I'm just thinking about US because the library pricing is only in US dollars. We usually recommend based on uh, information that we've received from our library partners that you would want to price your library price two to three times the retail price because with the one-to-one -one, uh, licensing where a library can buy one copy and they can loan it to one consumer at a time or one library patron at a time that book will be able to be borrowed forever um, and so what you want to do is you want to value it a little bit higher because you're only going to make that money once the other thing about that is it's still going to be of a great value compared to a large publisher title. The other thing about that is some of our library partners, and this is becoming more and more prevalent, is the cost per checkout model, where instead of getting that 47% that you would get from a from a one-to-one -one sale, you're getting roughly the equivalent in most cases about 10% of what the of what that price is that you put in there. But you get that every single time the library checks it out. So the curation on the library side is done a little bit differently. It's not curated and added to their account because they bought it. Sometimes the library will push a bunch of titles out and let the consumers or the patrons check those out. So that when you're thinking about libraries, you want to think about providing the library a good value, but also not too much value because you don't want to undervalue it. I, I think in the early days, of library support uh, and some of some of the other players who were distributing books to libraries before we got into the game um, they kind of flooded the libraries with really really cheap books <laughs> and so librarians in some cases libraries librarians I've spoken to in the last couple of years have said uh, they, they they're suspicious because they got some really shady sort of titles that they thought were oh, hey, it's only it's only $1.99 what a great price uh, and and they they now very very often equate low price to low quality so that's another reason why you may want to go a little bit higher. Guys, what, what have I missed on libraries? Because it's such a big area for us. Yeah, I, I think you got most everything that I yeah. would make sure to mention. Uh, we're just excited about libraries. It's It really stinks that if you're exclusive with Amazon, you can't be in libraries. It stinks that uh, some of the traditional publishers are uh, doing these embargoes and different things to libraries. And so we think it's a huge opportunity for indies to come in. You know, libraries are a key part of discovery, um, not just for like just this moment for lifetime readers, though. I mean, that's definitely what made me a huge fan of so many different series. Those are all series I've gone on to buy the digital books of audiobooks 30, 40 years later. And so um, it's an incredibly short sighted of the traditional publishers to be um, treating libraries and librarians poorly. 
it's short sighted and it's a but it's a huge opportunity for indie publishers. This is this is a hot time to make sure your books are in libraries and that you are marketing to librarians uh, to say, you know, if you like if your readers are looking or your patrons are looking for, uh, you know, Dan Brown, uh, they might love Kevin Tomlinson. Uh, just a little plug right there. Um, okay, so I have a uh, question from Lynn Arkdale. Ar Ar I'm sorry, Arcady. I'm sorry about that, Lynn. Lynn Arcady asks, uh, is there a benefit of book one free as far as visibility if we go through D2D? &D? Um, really, the, the book one free thing, it's, it's kind of, <laughs> there's some variety going on here in the world and it doesn't really matter whether you're going through draft to digital or not with, with this part of it. Uh, but the book one free can be very beneficial. It's usually kind of down to what genre you're writing in, uh, because there's so many free books out there right now that it's become a little watered down. Um, but as a way to introduce people to your series and to get people interested, uh, it doesn't have all the magic marketing muscle that it used to have, but it is a, still a good way and a good thing to send to people uh, to get them kind of on board. So uh, yeah, you can still use that. And through draft digital, you can price to zero uh, for most of the markets. Um, and Amazon will match uh, those prices if you uh, alert them to it. Uh, even though you can't price to zero on Amazon through us or Amazon at this point. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, we'll, we'll help you out with that all we can. Uh, mostly you're just going to have to experiment and see if that's going to be effective for you. I, I kind of like doing the first and series free on a uh, sort of round robin uh, method uh, where every now and then I make that book free and push it out with a, you know, like a book bub or something like that, um, uh, as a way to onboard people in this, into the series. So that's, been, that's, what's been effective for me. Yeah, I, I would agree with that hundred percent. Um, some of the retailers do have places where they feature a free person series. And so when you have opportunities to take parts of those type of yeah. promotions, I'm encouraged that. Um, we have a couple of questions about print on demand that I thought I'd uh, start going through. Uh, the first one is from David Gumpert and he asked, uh, where does print on demand stand? Uh, as many of you know, we have a print on demand program right now in beta with Draft Digital. Um, right now, we kind of have, we're not pulling in new people into the beta uh, because we are revamping the user interface a little bit. Uh, at first, we thought that most people that were wanting to use our print on demand service would be people that were using us for digital distribution as well. Uh, it turns out there's a lot of people that we just want to use the print side uh, of things with us. And so we are kind of separating the process out a little bit. We originally had it very integrated into our ebook e workflow, but the people who are just using us for print, it just made a lot more sense to make it a little bit easier for them. Uh, and so once we get all that done, we'll start bringing in more people to test the user interface. Um, things have gone very well with like making books available uh, to the different retailers. Um, we are looking, uh, still looking for partners to handle uh, the author copy side of things well in international countries. Uh, the cost of shipping is still very, very high uh, through our current providers. And so we're always looking for how can we make that easy for people because we work with authors all over the world. So the next front demand question uh, I had was, uh, does DDD have an arrangement with English Spark in order to get our print books with you in the bookshops? Um, we don't have a direct uh, relationship with Ingram Spark. Uh, in a lot of cases, Ingram Spark uh, owns a lot of the different uh, printers around the uh, the U.S. And so, uh, our partner is IPG. They do use Ingram Spark sometimes to print the books. Uh, your books do become available in the Ingram catalog. And so, when small uh, bookshops sh are looking for your book, it's going to be there. Uh, same thing with libraries. And so, it makes it very easy for anyone to order. Uh, your book. The final question I wanted to address on uh, print on demand uh, was from Lori, Lori Gynap. I hope I said that right. I'm not sure. Is there a benefit to being on both D2D and Ingram Spark for print? And the answer is they overlap. And so that if you're already on Ingram Spark, there's not really a benefit. Um, with the D2D uh, print, we're not charging you fees to make changes and everything. And so for a lot of people, it's going to be a better option. Um, but Ingram Spark does give you a lot more 
you know, if you're looking to do hardbacks, you're looking to do a lot of different types of formats, we're not going to support as many formats as they do at first. That's all the ones I've got for now. That was good. I'm glad you're able to batch that. I think there was another question that came in from uh, Ashlyn. Ashlyn asked, what's the newest on print books? So I think, yeah, uh, I think uh, Ashlyn, uh, Dan answered your questions um, from there as well. So that was good. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Prints another one. I can't wait until it's fully launched. Oh, so I mean, me neither. I mean, <laughs> I've been using. It. I have to tell you, I use it. Uh, Mark uses it. Uh, all my print books are available via D D print right now, um, and it's been just, it's been great. I mean, I, I I can't wait to see the improvements that that are made when we update the interface. But it is, uh, it is every bit what you hope it will be, yeah. uh, as far as the quality of the books and. The way it works so. and, and and an additional call out and thank you to all of the beta users who've helped us with this because yeah. if it wasn't for their feedback we would uh you know for everyone else out there to make it so much better when when it launches wide if i can turn into a different direction melissa care uh, asks uh, with collaborative groups such as uh, the formal kindle world and box sets what's the best way to promote these types of sets so i thought i'd start but i know kevin you've got some experience in this as well I think, uh, Melissa, the, the key thing about collaborative groups is that one of the benefits of a collaborative group is that you may have an audience of people who love and appreciate your writing and your style. And then you probably have other authors in the same genre who appreciate and love your style. And the whole reason you do a collaboration, whether it's a bundle, whether it's a uh, something in, well, Kindle Worlds doesn't exist, but you know, D2D Universes, is that you're all leveraging your own audience to help discover other great books that people want to read. There are people who read more and more, the whale readers, the ones who enjoy an amazing thriller by Dan Brown. And they say, oh my God, this Kevin Tumlinson guy, I'm going to check him out too. And I'm going to check out Joanna Penn because they all write the very similar style genres. So you're getting Dan and Joanna and Kevin working together. They're each going to call upon their own audiences. And I know Kevin has a bigger audience than Joanna or Dan Brown. So he'll probably be carrying the two of them. But that's the kind of thing that happens is you say, let's say I have 500 people and you have 500 people and someone has 500 people. There may be overlap, but that's, that's part of the joy. And so when I would advise when you're collaborating with people, don't just think about the crossover in, in, in the style of writing and, uh, and, and the books and the themes and the genres. Think about, are these people actually going to help? Are they going to actually participate? Or are they actually going to be you know, dragging you down, just be, you know, taking, taking the ride without doing any work? So that's something to consider, I think, when you're thinking about those sets. Um, Kevin, I'm sure you've got some other ideas on, on that yeah, I mean, collaboration. The biggest strength of collaborative uh, marketing is that everybody uses, you know, everyone should have their own uh, email newsletter, their own ma mailing list, right? So everybody gets to uh, kind of spread the wealth a little and uh, cross promote. And it's a natural fit because your work's in there. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't think about is if you got any any folks in the group that are actually pretty good at the Facebook ad side of things, you can actually create lookalike lists based on each of your mailing lists and uh, use that to promote the work even further uh, to folks that you you know you don't already promote to. Uh, so that's one one way I've seen these. Uh, it's really great because. You know, you can do your own lookalike lists, and it is pretty useful on Facebook. But but have like if you've got eight different writers in an anthology, and all of you go out and do this, uh, your reach is far greater, and you're also um, able to multiply the effect of your marketing dollars that way. Um, so those those sorts of things are, are things I would consider, uh, and uh, you know, it, it really kind of comes down to how you're leveraging your platforms. Uh, so it's not just uh, mailing lists, but it's also your social media reach and that sort of thing. So uh, it's good to, as Mark was saying, uh, try to find folks who are, uh, you know, going to be additive for your marketing effort. Uh, maybe they've got an audience you don't have that you don't normally talk to. One of the, one of the issues that uh, like me and Nick Thacker and Ernie Dempsey have is that we essentially have the same readers. So we're always, uh, when we cross promote, we're just getting hundreds of emails from folks that say, yeah, I'm already on Ernie's list. I'm already on Kevin's list. Uh, so it is kind of good to branch out and find uh, folks that you don't normally see or work with or hear from. Uh, and so that you can leverage a, a, a new pocket of their marketing of that marketing space. I had a question from a, from a 
from David Gumper here. Uh, and I, I see it's, is there a way to make books available for free to reviewers, media, et cetera? Uh, and in, I'm going to plug uh, our good friend, Damon Courtney at book funnel for this one. Cause that is my favorite way to do that. If you haven't checked out book funnel, it's bookfunnel.com. Uh, Damon has built a, an amazing service. I mean, uh, practically everyone in the industry uses it at this point. Uh, but that for a fairly low fee, uh, you can actually make your book available to anyone who wants to download it. There's, there's some safety features built into this, like watermarking the file so that if it gets shared on uh, privacy sites, you can track down who shared it. Uh, there's also these, uh, he's got some tools like, uh, I forget what he calls it, but it's like a mailing list thing where, uh, you know, you can actually see uh, if you send out uh, to say an ARC group, uh, you can see who's downloaded and who hasn't. Uh, so there's a lot of little features in there, stuff I don't even use yet. I mean, I, there's there's features built in this thing I haven't even used yet. So Book Funnel is the uh, tool of choice for Kevin Thomason at least, and and maybe for D to D in general. Uh, for oh for yeah, the- definitely. No one's yeah. better than Bowman. Oh, yeah. that is digital copies. Uh, just Digital copies, to, to clarify, right. um, gets expensive. I, I wouldn't say there's a lot of reason as an indie author to print ARCs and send them out. Um, yeah. You know, there's a handful of reasons why you might do so, but it's uncommon. So digital copies, book funnel is the way to go. Um, I had a question that I want to make sure and get to because it was asked pretty early on from Pamela Curry. Uh, can open office be used to create text with pictures to a 30 to 40 page youth book on animal activism. I would not use open office for that. In fact, it's very difficult. Um, pictures and eBooks, uh, generally you're going to want to hire a professional film matter to work with you on that. Uh, most eBooks and most of the readers are designed around the idea of flowable text, uh, which works very well with uh, fiction EPUBs um, because you've just got text. When you start adding in pictures, you got to remember that you're making, you're trying to make a book that will work on any device. And it might be, you know, a very small smartphone. It might be an iPad. It might be a Kindle. They range in sizes and the dimensions. Uh, so it's very hard to get pictures to look exactly right. Um, in addition to that, Amazon charges fees based on the file, like delivery fees based on the, the file size. And so if you use pictures that are too high resolution, you might end up making your book where you're not making any money off of it. Um, so there's something called a fixed uh, format layout, um, which is more aimed at picture books. Um, from what I've seen, there's not a lot of children haven't moved over to eBooks in the same way that adults have, um, you know, for the most part, adults are going to be buying books for children as gifts. So it's just not as big of a market. Um, if you want to get into it and there are people that are making some money on it, uh, I would look into some of the other fixed layout formatting options or um, like Amazon has their own, uh, I can't think of the name of software. It's like some Amazon creator or something that's for making books that have pictures in them. Uh, Apple has their own creator as well. Unfortunately, with both of those, it's exclusive to their platform. So there's no easy way to make something that will work on Amazon, that will work on Apple, that will work, work on Kobo. Um, it's kind of the wild west out there for trying to do a picture book of any sort. That's uh, often the so. area where I, uh, I mean, Vellum can do some Ooh. some of that, but uh, that's where I usually say if it's if it's a graphic intense book, chances are it's not going to sell as well in ebook as it would in print because it's it's bound by that form, that fixed layout, but yeah, that would be definitely. the area where you may want to hire an actual professional designer. Mm. I mean, as good as the free tools are, um, that that's probably an area you may want to consider. You um, should reach out to us too, though, to, uh, before you commit um, and ask us questions about that sort of thing. Cause uh, we do have some folks on staff who are, uh, who've done this sort of thing for quite a while and they know how to, they, you know, they know what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how, how frequently this comes up, actually. People are really, they really want those images and footnotes and figures all like perfectly lined up uh, in their ebooks. <laughs> I can kind of understand it, but. Yeah, yeah we, um, we, in fact, we had a, a further question. I'll just go, since we're talking about it now, uh, Judy Shearwaters, uh, having problems with children's ebooks with large pictures, any ideas? 
the same thing we've just been talking about. Like it's just right now the ebook market is not well suited to right. books with pictures. Um, you know, we hope that changes. There's really not a, a lot of reasons to charge any delivery fees. Uh, Apple doesn't charge those. Kobo doesn't charge those. And so we're hoping all of the retailers will start allowing it. Um, it's EPUB it's three like, would allow graphics a little bit better than EPUB two yeah. does, um, but it's still not perfect. Um, it's sad that not everyone supports EPUB three yet. So yeah, it, it's just it's a crazy market for anything with lots of graphic images. Right. Can I jump into another question? Yes. Dive on in, sir. Uh, Alana Terry asks, is there any benefit to being on both D2D and Publish Drive? Um, thanks for asking that, Alana. It's a, it's a good question. Our, our approach, our philosophy has always been authors should always be in control. Authors should always have choice. And our goal is to provide tools that allow you to, uh, as Dan said earlier, you get to opt in. We don't just automatically send your stuff anywhere. We allow you on a title by title basis to control where it's being sent. We do everything we can to save you the time. We are a distributor and we make money when you actually sell books. So the whole idea is provide some great free tools, help authors with it and get you into the market. Now, Publish Drive also distributes to different markets and uh, they're available, like they have some Asian markets and other markets that draft to digital is not uh, in. So you may want to look at that. The one thing to be aware of is Publish Drive isn't the same type of business as draft to digital They recently pivoted and we just, we were just hanging out with Kinga from Publish Drive at uh, Vegas. And I was on a, had a fortune enough to be on a panel with her as well. And their model has changed. They're not a, a distributor so much as they are a subscription service for authors. So I know they have an opportunity where you can publish one book and it doesn't cost anything, but the rest of their model is based on uh, charging you a monthly fee for use of their tools, but then giving you um, the full royalty as if you were publishing direct to right. each market. So again, as an author, you need to look at your business model. You need to look at, does this make sense for you? And that goes for us. That goes for Publish Drive. It goes for whether you're going to go direct or whether you're going to use an aggregator or, or, or however you want to do your publishing thing. So Sure, there are benefits depending on your goals, and and there's uh, there's side effects. I mean, no matter what you choose, there is no one right way to publish. The only right way to publish is the way that works best for you and your author business. I think yeah. that's that's probably a a good way to answer that. I hope. Yeah, and Do I, I mean, pass? did I pass, Dan? Do I passed. get to keep my job? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my answer would have just been no, uh, but. That's me. I'm biased, but no, uh, but in all seriousness, though, uh, we never we never try to deter anyone from using in any of our quote competitors uh, because there are different uh, benefits to going with different services, and sometimes uh, we have authors who are actually using us and multiple other services to do this stuff. Um, to me, I, I, I like to keep things simple. I like to keep uh, everything in one place. Uh, it's kind of the OCD in me. Uh, but for some folks, you know, there's a, there's a big advantage to, uh, doing both. So it just really kind of, again, yeah, I, I hate that this is always the answer, but it always comes back to your plan, your strategy and your goal. Uh, you have to kind of figure out in advance what kind of author you're trying to be and what kind of career you're trying to have. And if that fits you, then, uh, then go that route and we will still be here for you. I promise. <laughs> oh, that was sweet. We had a ton of questions. Like we're getting a lot of great questions uh, yeah. today. So I just want to uh, hop on with uh, Melissa A. Kier had a follow-up question about Walmart. Uh, do you find that they limit the types of books they accept? Um, as far as we've been able to tell, it's the exact same rules as Kobo. So there's some erotica they don't accept. Um, other than that, if it works at Kobo, it's probably going to show up in the Walmart library. Um there was an issue, and I don't think it's resolved yet, where free first and series weren't showing up on the Walmart portal, but they were on the Kobo site that it redirects you to. Um, I know that they were looking at that. I don't, I don't remember if that's been resolved or not yet. So just something to be aware of. Uh, Wolf O'Rourke, my, my favorite name uh, that pops up in these things, has asked, uh, is it a problem if I already have a print book page at Amazon? And uh, really depends on what you're trying to do there, but no, not really. Uh, it's not a problem. You can actually, unlike eBooks, uh, there's no real problem with having multiple distributors distributing versions of your 
print book. The only real limitations are that you can't use the same ISBN uh, between different, you know, we'll call them different versions of the book. Or at least you shouldn't. Uh, although, didn't someone recently pointed out to me that I think uh, Ingram Spark or somebody is telling everybody to, to that they definitely should be doing that? Is that um, is that a thing <laughs> that maybe I should be aware of? I don't think so. No. <laughs> yeah, I think you should be using a different ISBN for each version of the book, um, just to keep the uh, to tracking and everything right and keep confusion down. But yeah, really, there's no problem. You're not going to be penalized for having your book distributed through Amazon and DD Print and Ingram Spark if you want. In fact, it's a good way to do very uh, multiple versions and editions if you want to go that route. The book. Do we have other questions? Yeah, I know we got lots of other yeah, questions. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, Richard H. Stevens, who I know lives in my neck of the woods. We uh, saw each other in Vegas, even though we live in the same town. <laughs> he said, sorry if I missed it. That's okay. Don't apologize. Do you offer author copies through D2D and are they printed in Canada? So through the beta program, we do author offer um, print copies to authors. They are coming from IPG, which is in the US. So as a fellow Canadian author, I can tell you that I have been uh, trying to source local print copies for authors on this side of the border to try and make it less expensive because even though the, the, the print cost is pretty good, it's once that crosses the border that that becomes scary. So Richard, I am looking out for my fellow Canucks here as the, as the only guy in the Canadian draft digital office here in Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, I, we're looking into that and we're going to try to get the best possible. I'm thinking volume. of creating a book, a, a business called Book Mule where Ooh. I basically just have somebody uh, pile, you know, a bunch of books in the back, their trunk of their car and drive them across the border at, <laughs> like an illicit run. And, but then there'll be all these TV shows about these, you know, the, the gangsters and getting books across yeah. the border into Canada and it'll just be, you know, queen, <laughs> queen of the North, maybe, maybe. Uh, Alyssa, Alyssa recommended book to border. Book would to be border. The, uh, <laughs> Dodge draft to digital. Um, okay. Uh, we still got, oh, we still got plenty of time. I thought we were close to wrap. For some reason, I thought we were close to having to wrap up. I, this whole thing has thrown me off with the, uh, the, the, <laughs> <Reboot>. <laughs> the whole thing dropping out. <laughs> um, I don't have a question marked for next Mark. So you guys can feel free. Go ahead and grab what you need. Yeah. I think Dan had a couple. Okay. Yeah. I've got yeah, a couple. Dan's got some. Um, yeah. So Krista Gill asked, how can I get my books on DDD notice at libraries and Scribd? Um, so with libraries, the first thing, make sure all of your readers know that your books are available in the libraries and that they can request them from their local libraries. I think this is especially important if you're coming out of Kindle Unlimited. Uh, you know, frequently people will complain because they don't have the funds to uh, just buy a book. And so Kindle Unlimited was a good deal for them. When you go wide, let them know that the local library very well might have you know, your book available so they can check it on your local library. And if they don't, then they can request your book through Overdrive, through Biblioteca, through whatever service provider that library works with. Um, we do a number of promotions around the holidays with them. Um, we, I, I believe it's about 2,000 books that uh, are taking part in the uh, overdrive holiday promotion uh, going on that just started recently. Um, we just send out emails about those, so make sure that you are, are checking your email that you use for your draft digital account every once in a while because we will send out uh, notices when there is a promotion that your book might be eligible for. Uh, in this case, uh, it was eligible for just about all books, so it wasn't like, um, you know, some of them are just for romance, some of them are just for um, uh, books with beaches on covers. Uh, the promotions kind of vary by vendor, uh, but uh, just make sure that you're checking your email and responding to us in a timely manner on those promotions that we offer. Um, I don't have a lot of advice about Scribd. Scribd kind of uses an algorithm to take books in and out depending on a couple of factors uh, of their lending uh, library. Um, I think the best thing with Scribd is just to uh, I, like with the libraries, let readers know, hey, if you're looking for a subscription service, Scribd offers audiobooks. They offer a lot of traditional books that Kindle Unlimited does not have. Uh, your books are available there, et cetera, and it's got a great price. Um, they seem to favor nonfiction. Our, our outliers tend to be nonfiction at, at Scribd. 
So if you're uh, a nonfiction author, that might be a place to look more uh, for possible opportunities. Can, can I add something, something about libraries? Yeah, now? go for it. Yeah, so one of the strategies that I always take is always define yourself as a big fish in a small pool. Uh, and so start with your local library, make sure they know you exist. Well, you know, if you're familiar with the library and you know your books are on OverDrive and you know that library uses OverDrive or Baker and Taylor or Hoopla or whatever the system is, let the library know you're a local author, you have a novel set in the town or city where you live. Right. Um, and, and, and not just the acquisitions people. I, I always say, talk to the reference librarian because when I've been researching uh, books, the reference librarian is my best friend. They are data nerds. They love to gather information. If they know that you're a local author and you write, you know, uh, archaeological thrillers or you write true ghost stories or or you write a, a, a you know a motivational business book or whatever, knowing that you're a local author who has that may come up in the future when they're helping other people find really really great books to read. Librarians love putting the right books into the right people's hands. They just, they feed off of that. So start local, start with your local libraries and then expand out. So for example, in my case, I'd reach out to the Waterloo library in, in the city that I live in and then reach out to the Kitchener, which is a neighboring city. And then I would reach out to the, you know, the, the, the region. And then I would reach out to the province and, and define myself as a Waterloo author, a Kitchener Waterloo author, an Ontario author. And so start, start with that and expand out. Um, so long as you're professional in your approach and you, and you think about what is this book doing to provide the library with value for its patrons. If you approach it with that perspective and you share that perspective with the librarian, they're more likely to see why it is a really great idea that they should carry your book. So uh, a non-library question, uh, and I'm going to pronounce this name as Dara Do Doherty. And I'm going to pray I got it correct. Uh, so, do you recommend sending out review copies to popular reviewers, a uh, reviewer on reviewers on platforms like YouTube? Um, and I think there was a question, Dan, you've marked about uh, uh, about promoting on Twitter that might be related to this. But uh, the there is a whole YouTuber like uh, booktuber kind of thing going off uh, right now, and it's been around for quite a while. And those folks can be uh, crazy beneficial to you if you can get a book pr uh, featured. Uh, they typically they do things that that you know build up a huge audience, and that's a huge audience that's well vetted. Their readers and and a lot of times these uh these guys are aimed at a particular genre. So if you're going to do it, I would recommend uh, hunting around on YouTube to find folks who are reviewing books that are in your general genre or specific genre and uh, focusing most of your effort on those guys. Um, the one, the one thing I would recommend against uh, is some of these folks will ask for, uh, they'll ask you to pay them. And I, I have, have a very strict rule about that. I'd never pay anybody to uh, do reviews. Uh, it's always, if I've ever done it, it's always backfired in one way or another. Uh, and there are plenty of folks who are willing to do the review for the free book because they're getting paid for views or whatever. Uh, anyway, they're able to monetize the videos anyway. So I think it's a great uh, tool. I think, uh, you know, it's underutilized by the industry. It's a kind of questionable how effective it really is overall. But as long as you're not paying them for it, uh, you might as well get the content out there. It can be you can share that uh, with your own audience and that benefits them and you. So I say, I, I, <laughs> I would say in that case, you probably do want to send them a physical copy because they are going to like be showing it, holding it on their channel. So it's one of the rare cases point. where a physical copy is a better idea. Than they'll probably ask copy. you for a physical copy to be. Yes. Frank. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll tell you, they'll give you the guidelines of what you, uh, what you need to do for them, what you need to send them. Uh, I've done some of these where they had me go on and fill out like an entire like Google form uh, with all my, my bio information, website information, all that. And then that gives me an address where I have to send usually two copies um, for whatever reason, variety of reasons, probably they probably give one away or something like that. So uh, let's address that Twitter question real quick. because it kind of goes along the uh, Marilyn Melton. How do I promote a, on Twitter, do I use the DTD URL? Um, I would encourage you to, if you've got a book just coming out, or if you have a uh, your a book on sale, uh, to let your Twitter followers know. Uh, yeah. a, a universal book link is one of the best ways to do that. It's going to be the books to read link. 
Um, you can set that up. That way it takes the readers to what, whichever retailer they prefer to go to. Mm -hmm. um, in general, other than that, I wouldn't really spend a lot of time trying to promote books on Twitter. Uh, it, Facebook ads, Amazon ads, BookBub ads are all more effective ways right. in general. Um, exceptions to that would be if you have a huge Twitter following and you're a subject matter expert in something, uh, maybe Twitter becomes effective for you. But for most authors, Twitter is not going to be a effective use of your social media time. Um, but you do want to have a Twitter handle out there. Yeah. Um, we have any, additional tools. I'm sorry, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, no, probably, go ahead. That's all I had to say about it. I was just going to see if you guys had a different experience. Yeah. So there's uh, among other things. So we have our uh, new release notifications that you could use Twitter to, to try. This is a good use of Twitter is to try to get people to sign up for your, your new release notifications. Uh, it's not a mailing list per se, uh, but it is, they are handing over their email address to be alerted anytime you uh, release a new book. So it is a good way to, to sort of promote from the side. And then we have um, our, our draft digital author pages and book tabs, uh, which are a way for you, something you can share on Twitter very easily, but the author pages in particular, if you, especially if you don't already have a web presence, this is a great sort of landing page to send people. And it has links for all your social media, social media, plus um, you can, have them sign up to follow you through new release notifications, or you can link to where they can sign up to get on your mailing list online. So if you're using a, an email man, uh, marketing service, uh, you can put the link in there for that. So uh, these are all great tools because they're shareable. Uh, there is a way, there are links to share these pages from there. So you should encourage your followers to go check it out and share it on Twitter. Uh, and that's a great way to kind of broaden your platform. Yeah, can I Definitely. share another thing about um, about the landing pages and the rating lists? Is what I love so much about this is that um, you know we spend all our time begging and hoping that the retailers will feature books from authors that we really want to help support and prop up. Reading lists allow you, the author, to be in control. Uh, there's an amazing group of romance writers. Uh, Julie Strauss is a friend of mine, and that's how I know this group. But they have this new series called Ticket to True Love. And it's eight different authors and they're all writing in the same universe. They're all publishing their own books independently to all the platforms, but they have a landing page that they're leveraging this for where all their books are featured. And, uh, you know, as each new release comes out, uh, and I know this because I saw that Julie had just released her book in that series, but, you know, she may be spotlight, uh, spotlight this week and the next week when somebody else in the series is spotlight. But then they also have the links to all their other books and then links to their author pages. So you can be very creative in how you leverage these free tools. And I love creative ways that put you in control as the author. So when you're working on collaborations like that, whether it's an anthology, whether it's whatever. For Halloween, I was, I was fooling around a bunch of authors online and I created booze to read for Halloween. And I, and I just reached out to a group of authors in an online group and said, hey, does anyone have any sort of Halloween or spooky themed books? I'm going to put them all in this, in this reading list. So I'm going to have you know, one of my books and then a whole bunch of other books that are on the same theme. So yeah, do, do take advantage of that. But speaking of taking advantage of something, we have something really exciting that we want to talk about, don't we? I don't know how exciting it is. I think it's <laughs> exciting when we get to chat one on one with these amazing <laughs> authors that we get to work with. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, we like to do this after every uh, webinar, and that is uh, open things up so that you have an opportunity to consult with one of us one on one in a free thirty minute author consultation. That so, is exciting. I that is pretty exciting. I'll, I'll admit. Okay, it is exciting. Um, now you don't know who you're going to get. It's uh, luck of the draw. Uh, and there are no special requests, but for a, a limited number of slots, by the way, because we, we all have limited time and there's only so much time in the day. But if you head on over right now, and I, and I am dead sure that Alyssa is dropping this link into the uh, Facebook uh, group right now. But if you go over to bit.ly slash D2D consult, that's bit.ly slash D2D consult. Uh, you will be able to, uh, you'll find, you'll find a calendar there. You can uh, pick a time and date that works for you and it'll be automatically assigned to one of the three of us. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed doing this. It's been pretty remarkable to see what's that. Even the, uh, the folks who've been around for a while and 
uh, are pretty knowledgeable. I'll get a few of the a few of you guys in this uh, to not really just not really get a consultation, but to kind of talk shop and you know sort of uh, reaffirm what you're doing and maybe get a little inspiration or some advice on something maybe you have some trouble with. So it, you don't have to worry about your level. You can come in at any level, the will be author and the already doing it author. So uh, we love doing that. And so jump on in and uh, check that out. And we uh, and do that now. Do it quickly because these things fill up very fast. <laughs> but, but in the Definitely. midst of doing that, doesn't Dan have an announcement that we're going to share? I do. I wouldn't say it's an exciting announcement, but it is an announcement just that you need to be aware of. This was the not exciting the thing world. That I thought we were talking about. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so so ne- next week, for all of you who are not Americans, uh, we do have a big holiday uh, coming up, Thanksgiving. So our offices are going to be closed down uh, Thursday and Friday of next week. Uh, that's true of a lot of our different retailers as well. And so you just want to make sure if you've got anything coming up, uh, you want to get it in before the end of day Wednesday. Really, you want to get in like Wednesday morning at the very latest uh, so that we all have time to process it, get it to the retailer. Um, so just be aware of that. There's going to be uh, a little while where we might not be able to answer all your questions. Right. We are going to be watching for emergencies over that period. But um, for the most part, we don't have anyone at our retailers to reach out to expedite anything because everyone's mostly on holiday. And we are work obsessed. So if you do have questions and you post them on Twitter or something, we're probably going to someone, probably me, will uh, will give you some kind of answer. So there's also a Canadian hanging out who might be around because I'm not going to be getting stuffed up on Turkey. We did that last month. Yeah, you guys are just so, so, so if you if you need anything, just reach out to Mark. He's Canadian. He has nothing to be thankful for. He's just going to be sitting around. So it'll be <laughs> pretty fine. much. Um, the other thing is just start, start thinking about the month of December because uh, we'll be sending out some emails to let you know the holiday hours of our different retailers. Um, but same thing, uh, the retailers closed down for a good chunk of you know Christmas Eve on to New Year's. Many of the retailers are shut down in their offices, and so yeah, uh, I you apologize. Support that during that time, but you you need to get your books in advance. So. Uh, Apple has let us know already. December 13th is like the latest date to submit a book. Um, so you want to make sure you've got any uh, pre-order you've got coming out or any new thing that you want up before January 4th, really January 5th, I would say. You want to get in by December 13th at the latest. So just be aware of that because every year we try to let people know, but uh, there's nothing we can do uh, after a certain point. Uh, everyone's on holiday. And so, I, I have to I have to apologize to everybody. We did turn on the link, and but what I did not do was set the uh, the date range. Uh, it should be set now. So go ahead and pop in there. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I'll even extend it a little just so that uh, we can make up for the for that goof. And if uh, I know I didn't expand, I'll I'll try and expand my time availability into some of the evenings. So uh, I'll be doing that in the next probably four or five hours uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. So. And by the way, if if for some reason uh, you discover that Christmas Day and Christmas Eve are, are wide open for events, uh, we didn't mean for them to be. So <laughs> show some mercy and don't pick those dates. I'm going to try to make sure those are blocked off. But You uh, may want to see our family and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> we will reschedule you. Just know that. <laughs> Yeah, we may say, "Hey, can we can we move this?" Uh, so, guys, thank you so much for uh, uh, Kevin and Dan for hanging out. I, I love hanging out with you guys. It was great. I got to see you in person last week. Alyssa, thank you so much for all the amazing work you're doing behind the scenes, making us look good. And uh, you authors, thank you for hanging out and as asking some amazing questions. We we can't be as good as we are without all of the amazing authors in our community as well. So, thank you guys so much. Take care, everybody. Definitely. Thank you all. Have a good one.